please rise for the pledge. But wait till everybody stands and then nobody will start until you start the pledge. Yep, just like that. No, I, I, could I get a motion to amend the agenda? Yep. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, here we go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mark yeah. Yeah. Purchase the tax credits. All right, call this meeting to order. I call this meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to get a motion to I'd like to get a motion to approve the agenda. I'll all make a motion. Say aye. I'll make that motion to approve the agenda. I'll second it. Okay. There's a second by Councilmember Monroe, seconded by Councilmember Henry. Now all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. My brother. <laughs> Thanks, man. Good, job. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank your mom for doing such a great job. Oh, she's right there. That was, that's my buddy. All right, um, moving on to number four. Um, Mark is on his way. All right. We have a little special uh, something uh, to recognize a couple of kids in the community, and I want to wait until Mark gets here. Um, so I'd like to go back to that. But next on the agenda is exactly what we're here for, and that's our listening session. So with everybody's permission, um, when Mark gets here, um, at the easiest conversion, we can go right down to the kids' head agenda. Yeah, yeah. just get that out of the way. Yeah, you know what, let's, let's do that. Um, let's postpone the listening session. Just bear with me for like five minutes or so. He is on his way. Yes, just bear with me. Um, so we do not have any public hearings tonight, but uh, could I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Council Member Monroe. I'll second it. Second it. Jeez, this is going to be a whole evening. Motion, uh, second by Council Member Henry. Uh, any further discussion? Oh, there isn't any. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. We have no unfinished business. Um, Brent, um, if we could maybe start with the trident, because Mark is not here yet, and then we'll go after that right to the listening session. Okay. Thank you for your patience, by the way. It's very kind of you. Let us recognize a kid. Actually, before Tom, if you want to come up. So before we get into Trident, I asked Tom Denaway with Springstead to come and present to the council and really to residents and those that are watching an overview of tax increment financing. So within the, the Trident project for senior housing and uh, in a related project the council has been discussing and we'll discuss tonight with Lakeview Industries, there's been some discussion about tax increment financing and for um, folks that meet, can mean a lot of different things and so for transparency's sake we wanted to have a conversation and be able to answer questions and talk about what tax increment financing really is. So with that I'll uh, let Tom have at it. A little education. Yeah, thank you. Nothing like uh, being put on a time limit here, so hopefully I don't suck all the air out of the room. There's, there's no time limit. They might yell at you, but I mean. Well, hopefully this will be uh, at least a little informative, if not exciting. Uh, but my name is Tom <laughs> Denaway. I am with Springstead Incorporated. Stop him now. Stop. <laughs> Before Stop. we get into that. Sorry. Sorry. I apologize greatly. No worries. Um, you guys, come on up.
figure out who whose cat, cat it was. Maddie, Mark, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. You guys, thank you very much for your patience on that. Um, great kids. They walked around and they knocked on doors, and it was really cool to see. Um, so, sorry, but now you just got bumped. We're going to go back to the, uh, to the listening session. Uh, we're going to open that at uh, 5.1 uh, for the 2019 Improvement Project. Uh, I'll just turn it over to Mr. Merrick as uh, we are under strict orders not to speak. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This is a kind of a next step in kind of fostering an ongoing discussion about the 2019 improvement project. Um, the typical path for cities is to notify residents by, you know, public hearings and legal notices regarding special assessments and then Oftentimes cities kind of sit back and wonder why residents come upset and confused uh, and frustrated regarding the price, the dynamics of the project, and so on and so forth. And a lot of those things are still going to persist um, really in any project. But what we're trying to do is eliminate um, the confusion and help understand and help residents uh, with a venue to discuss the project. And so... Um, we've typically done at least one step in this process. The second step is new. The first step is we do a walking open house, and you can see a picture here. We bring out our engineers. We walk with the residents throughout the project area and ask them to point out areas of concern, um, talk about maybe specific engineering questions that they want to talk about, whether it's a mill and overlay compared to a full depth reconstruction, so on and so forth. What we'd like to do as this next step, a new step, is to bring those residents. We invited them to come to the meeting tonight um, within a, a handout uh, presentation format, we sent out what we heard and we're asking them to come tonight and talk to the council about things that we might have missed, things that they want to emphasize, uh, so on and so forth. And what we're hoping to do is have the council just listen to that tonight and that contemplate that and then bring that back at a later date to staff for additional direction as uh, Andrew Buddy and in the city engineer's office finishes up the feasibility study uh, for the project. And so just a brief overview of the project, we can get into the, some of the details, but it's, it's really kind of broken out into three buckets. Uh, the first, there are roadway improvements, uh, so that's curb and gutter, street reconstruction along Sunny Ridge Drive and what we'll call Old Elm, uh, alleyway improvements uh, in the downtown area, and then uh, road, street, and utility improvements, which would include new water and sewer, ser sanitary sewer, s excuse me, easy for me to say, sanitary sewer service um, in the Kirchie Hill Diedrich Drive area. And so when we had that walking open house, these were the, the seven primary points uh, that we heard. Um, this doesn't mean that this is an exclusive list, and this is frankly the point of trying to have this listening session. We sent the, these out to the folks in the project area um, asking them or telling them this is what we heard and so this is an opportunity for them to come back and say no this is important to me or this is important to my neighborhood etc to give the council a little bit more context and so I'll, I'll briefly go through the seven uh, the ma majority of residents were opposed to the placement of new sidewalks as a part of the project uh, residents were interested in exploring options for a new con road configuration at the end of old elm drive and if you I've made it down to that section of street. There is a kind of a weird configuration that kind of is a, frankly, a dead end road with, there's kind of a, an alleyway kind of that's blocked off with some bollards at the end. And so working with Brian and the city attorney and the city engineer, really trying to figure out what the best way is to provide emergency vehicle coverage in that area, uh, snow plowing service, et cetera. Uh, residents want their driveways and landscaping to be be repaired that's damaged as a part of the project. Um, a big part of this project is new water and sanitary sewer service, and so 
Uh, residents want to explore our options with the council on the length of the special assessments, the ability to have connection fees assessed, and the period of time to connect the city utilities. And I'll use the bucket analogy for uh, the connection piece too. There's, there's three uh, major pieces involved with the water and sanitary sewer connection. One is the city's um, construction part where the, the main lines are brought through the street and so that's residents are specially assessed for that. The city also has connection fees for uh, water and sanitary sewer. One is a local sanitary sewer fee and the other is a Met Council sanitary sewer fee and so that fee is charged, so that's the second bucket. Uh, the third bucket is the actual physical connection from the city's main line to the property owner's home and so uh, the city has been communicating to residents impacted by the project area that they'd have to contract with their own private uh, excavation contractor to make that connection from the city's main line uh, to their homes. Uh, residents also involved in that service or in that new service want to be able to use their existing well for outdoor water use. Uh, residents involved with that same service want to understand the benefits of connecting to the city water and sanitary sewer service compared to their existing well and septic systems. And then finally, residents uh, want the feasibility study to address the benefits of curb and gutter. There are uh, some areas, actually the, all the streets in our project area don't have existing curb and gutter. Um, and so that's an area that we've asked the city engineer to address in this feasibility study. So with that, <clears throat> I'd open it up to any residents that are in attendance to come forward to the council and either add to the list, list, emphasize items on this list, or maybe dispute things that they don't think were uh, maybe accurately depicted within the list. So we'd ask that we all stay organized, no fighting. <coughs> but please come up to the microphone, A, so everyone can hear you and you can, uh, we would appreciate it if you said your name and your number, uh, or sorry, your address, uh, so that we know who is speaking. It's now open. I'm Carol Hammers and I live on Sunny Ridge Drive. And the first one was, now, uh, right now we do not need a sidewalk, but this is a long-term project and I was wondering if, if maybe we're being penny wise and pound foolish not to put in a sidewalk while we can. That's just my only thought. Penny wise and pound foolish? I Sorry, I was just clarifying I'm not talking. Thank you. In my lifetime, we won't need a sidewalk, but this is a long-term project, and maybe my great-grandchildren might want one. Thank you. I know most of you and none of you are this bashful. Yo, you moved. Get up there. You moved. I saw ya. <clears throat> My name is Andy Burgess. I'm you can D sit down. I know. I'm okay, all right. I'm on Diedrich Drive and I've never had a house with a septic and sewer till now, or septic and a well, and I'm fine with that, but my worry is if I have to bring a private contractor in to hook up a pipe, how am I supposed to pay that on top of assessments? I have no problem if they could put it into an assessment, but I just, I can't do any more than what I'm already doing. I'd like to really stay where I'm at because we just bought the house. What street did you say you lived on? Diedrich Drive. Midtown Carver. Midtown, Midtown Carver. Carver. That's Midtown? <laughs> Big night tomorrow night. <clears throat> Wide open. There we go. Yeah, I live at uh, Third Street, and I was wondering how the name, 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 name for the record. How the, uh, we all know who you are, but you got to say your name and your address. I'm Dean Dualter. Yep. I live at 208 East 3rd Street in Carver. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering about the drainage problem down there. And uh, 
is there going to be any more work to fix that drainage problem? So to, yeah, to Dean's question, we talked about that during the walking open house, and that will be addressed in the feasibility study to correct that as a part of the project. Okay. So is, um, were you going to put a storm drain down there was my question. Once the plans and specs are prepared, we can arrange a meeting with you and the city engineer, and they can go over what their plan is to have that f fixed. Okay. And then we were going to, we talked, we were going to pave the alleys, and I missed out on I was a few minutes later and uh, with the assessment discussion. Yep. So later on in the process, so I would suspect September, October, we'll have a um, assessment number for, or a preliminary assessment number for all, all the impacted residents to take a look at. Oh, okay. So no real answers at this time. Right. So for tonight, we're just looking to get feedback from residents on what you want to see. They don't necessarily, the council doesn't necessarily have any answers tonight. They're just looking to make sure, like, you want this project to happen? Are you concerned about drainage, which it sounds like you are? You're concerned about the amount of assessment, et cetera? Yeah, well, then just, yeah, just questions. So, all right. Thanks, Dean. Hi, my name is Jaron Steinbach, and I live uh, at 708 Kirchie Hill Drive. And um, my main concern is um, uh, the price of the assessment. Um, when I first moved in in 2013, I received a, a letter in the mail from the city of Carver um, saying that uh, each homeowner was going to be assessed uh, $30,000. And then there's also been uh, there's also been other rumors that I've heard going around, but have been consistent of close to that same price of about twenty eight thousand um, dollars per household. And then um, and then what what you mentioned before um, tacking on uh, the price of us having to find uh, someone to hook us up to the service. And uh, for a newer homeowner like me, um, if that price is anywhere, if the price is actually anywhere near that, um, that's um, n not to be joking or anything, but pretty concerning uh, for me. Um, doing some math and some other things, checking out with other, what other cities have charged for their assessments for other road projects that were um, and complete reconstructions where they took out the old piping and put in the new and and hooking people up um, they were nowhere near that number so I guess um, I'm just concerned about it actually costing that much and I do see that in number four that everyone's um, or that people are talking about the length of special assessments but for me after doing some math and after making some phone calls uh, it'd have to at that price, if that price was actually true, it'd have to literally go out the rest of my mortgage for me to afford something like that. <laughs> so um, I don't know if there's uh, anything else the city council or, or anyone, um, uh, the city council or anyone else that, um, that can do anything different to lower that cost, if that cost is actually anywhere near that number. Um, uh, that's that would be my concern and i'd like to know that more i'd like to know that right off the bat rather than anything else like sidewalks or anything like that i'd like to know you know what what's what's the cost what what's the ballpark cost that's going to be and i actually called uh andrew the uh i think he's a city engineer here for good guys right over there oh yep yeah i called him last week and uh talked to him on the phone um and and thank you for giving me the time uh to do that um, and he said that uh, you folks didn't have a number yet and, and wasn't quite sure where I got my, my number from uh, in that uh, letter that I would got from the city. So uh, hopefully it's way off. <laughs> um, but that is my main concern. And uh, if that is how it would stand today, if, if this uh, 
um, if this project were to go through in anywhere near that number for price per, per household, uh, I would say no, that I don't, uh, I, I wouldn't want this to happen uh, for sure. Um, so, but you know, um, that's my concern and that's why I came tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alan Obzinski, 1023 Sunny Ridge Drive, and I don't want to contradict anything that Carol said before, but um, Sunny Ridge Drive, that little portion, there, we were out there for an hour with the engineers, and I think two cars came by which were locals, so I see no need to ever have a sidewalk there. I take um, our dog walking every morning, and I counted since we had the meeting, I think last week one time a pickup truck went past when I was walking down the road that wasn't a person on the block turning into their driveway. So I guess number one, um, we really oppose putting any sidewalks in there because, you know, because of the way the, the landscape is set up right now. And then secondly, um, I'd like some clarification on the curb and gutter feasibility study and whether that's really needed or not. Will that be something that's published or? Yeah, well, it's, it'll be included. We'll just go over the pros and cons of curb and gutter. So it's okay. incorporated into it. It's not an extra effort. Okay. But yeah, I'm, you know, I guess the, the biggest thing is the, the sidewalk part of it that I can't see anything in the foreseeable future or in the long-term future in that stretch of road because it's not a through street. It's, you know, basically just the residents driving down it. So, thank you. Thank you. Do we have the same barber? Thank you. Nice. Nice. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. You do your own too? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Brian Bunker. Uh, I live at 425 Diedrich Drive. Uh, I'm sure you guys have gotten a few calls on my house because we were in the process of selling it. And it's been a lot more difficult to sell it. Um, with nobody wanting to deal with the assessment. Um, so a lot of the questions that they're asking, you know, we don't have answers. We won't have answers till sometime August. Uh, I thought I heard October. September, October. September, October. Um, so we're kind of trying to actually get some sort of numbers on what this is going to cost us or potentially the next buyer. Um, so kind of the, if we can get it sooner the better is always great. Um, you know, it's going to be a big number and it's hard to be able to budget something that you know is coming but you don't know it's less than six months away, or a little more than six months away, but no, less than a year away to be able to get $30,000 for an example. Um, so uh, our neighbor actually had another question about uh, every six months we get a, a stormwater charge. Um, so she was kind of wondering, okay, what's going to happen with that? Are we still going to have to pay that along with city water and sewer? Um, which, I don't know. Yeah, I can add. The stormwater charge is charged to all residents right now. So that wouldn't change as, as a part of it. You just, there'd be an additional water and sewer charge. So we, that wouldn't actually be part of what we're, 
of the charge that we end up having to pay. If it's not rolled into it, it's just you still have to pay it. Correct. Okay. Um, on, let's see. Where'd it go? Uh, on the drainage, we definitely know in our, in our area that we do need better drainage. Um, kind of the, the guy beside me where it starts to do the turn, uh, his lawn always floods because we don't have, we, all the water comes down into that corner and then it kind of floods the street. And so we understand that one's definitely a necessity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Renee Giles at 1033 Sunny Ridge Drive. Um, two points. I am also opposed to the placement of sidewalks. When they built our development, in the mid 80s all the homes were placed towards the front of the road so the sidewalks would come really close to homes and property and landscaping and utilities so that's one of the reasons I'm opposed to that and second I'd like to um, what I'd like to see for my property when it rains all of the rain comes into the end of the driveway and pools and creates a big mud slough that we have to clean up every time <clears throat> so I'd like to make sure we have proper drainage and that if we have curb and gutter, that it doesn't make the problem worse. That at least it would be really nice if we could mitigate that issue and maybe have a outlet for the water to go be drained before it gets to the driveway. Even and What did you say your address was again, ma'am? 1033 Sunny Ridge. And Brent, I did email you some pictures of the last rainfall with the rain pouring into the driveway and the big mud slough, and she can kind of have a visual on that. That was it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Jenny, Jenny. Jenny Schultz, 1026 Sunny Ridge Drive. Um, I am pretty much opposed to the sidewalks on our street. Uh, one side of our street is um, all of the houses are built on a hill, and our driveway specifically is very steep um, and so a sidewalk would make the end of it a lot steeper um, and then on Renee's side how she was talking that the houses were built a lot more towards the front of the property so the sidewalks just don't quite make sense as far as the placement um, on our street and also again many people have discussed that it's pretty much just the people who live on that street, walk on that street, and drive on that street. We don't get a lot of through traffic. So it just doesn't seem feasible to spend the money <coughs> on a sidewalk. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Can you throw me one of those waters? Can you throw me a water? Never mind. Thank you. Bueller, anyone, anyone, Bueller, name the movie. Thank you. We're going to leave this open for a little bit. Is that all right? Sure. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add right now? Might think of something in a little bit. Like I said, we're going to leave that open. If anybody wants to come up at any point, um, please uh, wait for a break. A natural break natural break don't create one um, so let's uh, take a look and move to tax increment financing how about that thank you for your patience yes. and thank you all for your patience in waiting for the kids <clears throat> get back at it yeah thank you uh, Tom Denaway with Springstead Incorporated we are the city's public financial advisory firm uh, here tonight to talk quickly and briefly, hopefully, about tax increment financing. 
with the idea being that this presentation would be just to kind of hit the high points of TIFF a little bit about what it is and leave more of the project details for later dates when we're actually looking at specific projects. <clears throat> so just launching into this, uh, what is TIFF? TIFF is a method of capturing tax base growth resulting from the new development. <clears throat> So TIF would be capturing the new local taxes, the, that incremental growth in taxes, and using that, that future revenue to pay for public improvements related to the development. It's a fixed term for the capture, then that development gets added to the tax base. Uh, TIF is defined by state statute. It's uh, being refined constantly, uh, not quite each year, but uh, fairly frequently being refined by state statute and the legislature as to what we can use TIF for. The idea of TIF is to be a gap financing tool. It's to make projects happen that would not otherwise occur. And that's kind of commonly known as uh, the but for test or the but for finding and that the specific project being evaluated would not occur but for the use of the tax increment financing. It's to make projects feasible that would not otherwise be feasible on their own. So depending on the year created, there's different compliance requirements. Uh, TIF is used mainly by cities and counties, and it helps to provide incentive for development or to make projects feasible that would not otherwise be feasible on their own. So depending on the type of TIF district being contemplated, there's certain requirements for what needs to be in place for eligibility uh, for the creation of a district, and there's a certain, uh, there's a varying number of years for which a TIF district can be in place. Uh, for a redevelopment district, you have to have a heavily blighted and concentrated development. You need a site that has buildings on it. They want buildings to be on the site. The legislature doesn't want you to be able to qualify a greenfield site as blighted. <laughs> uh, so the idea is that the buildings or the property has to have buildings on it, and then that those buildings are blighted or in need of substantial renovation. Uh, as a result of that, that district is able to be in place for 25 years from the first receipt. So when we talk about terms of TIF districts. We're talking about from the years of first receipt is the way that the, the language is written. So it's all these years plus one. Uh, renewal and renovation is similar to re redevelopment, but it has a lighter, lighter qualification for findings. Uh, there's the two districts that the city is currently looking at uh, potentially proceeding with in the future. The first one would be a housing district. So a housing district requires the creation of low and moderate income housing and can be in place for 25 years from the first receipt. So one, we define low and moderate income housing uh, that a district or a project that's located within that district has to set aside a certain number of the units for people making certain percentages of the area median income. In the case of a housing TIF district, there's one of two tests. Either 20% of the units have to be set aside for people making approximately 50% or less of the area median income as adjusted for family size, or 40% of the units have to be set aside for people making 60% or less of the area median income. So in the case of this housing district, what's being proposed would be a, a senior housing district that would have a mix of uh, independent and assisted living units and the tw either 20 or 40% of the units within that project would have to be set aside for people of uh, meeting those qualifications. So that's one of the two projects that's being proposed. Uh, the other project would be an economic development district. So in order for a uh, project to be eligible for an economic development district, it has to have a job creation component, and specifically a, a manufacturing, industrial, or warehouse type job creation. Uh, office buildings wouldn't be eligible under that. Retail buildings wouldn't be eligible under that. It's more <laughs> industrial, manufacturing, warehouse distribution type. No retail. Yeah, no retail uh, type uses. So in, uh, in return for the that activity being present within an economic de development district, it's able to be in place for eight years from the first receipt, so nine total years. So the project that's being proposed would be a manufacturing project that would be located potentially within an economic development TIF district. So what can we use TIF revenue for? So we have certain limitations set by the legislature as to how we can use that future tax dollars and what we can fund uh, up front with project costs. So it's public improvements, land acquisition, soil correction, site prep, demolition, relocation, financing fees, and interest related to that. And the city can retain up to 10% of the TIF revenue for administrative expenses specifically related to the administration of the TIF district. You can't just carry over that 10% and dump it into the general fund. It has to be specifically related to the administration of the TIF district, unfortunately, to a certain degree. 
Uh, so public improvements, those types of things that are fall under the public improvement heading are project costs related to the development, adjoining roads, sewer water, public utilities, those types of public improvements. We can't use TIF to build community centers or city halls and the like. It has to be specific to the project. And the other, the other costs are you know, what we typically refer to as ground and down type costs. Those would be private improvements related to the project that would be eligible for reimbursement, acquisition of the land, soil correction, on-site preparation costs, demolition, you know, on-site grading and parking improvements and the, those types of things would be the soil correction, site prep, those, those type of costs. So uh, yeah, again, as, as I mentioned, the public, public improvement costs allowed are these types of costs, but there, there has to be a nexus between these costs and the project. So one of the things that we're gonna be talking about in the future with the economic development project would be a road that would be adjacent to that project would be an eligible use of TIF. So the TIF boundaries would be the parcel and, and all adjacent right of way to that TIF parcel or the parcel within the TIF district. So those are the types of things that are allowed under public improvements but no general government uses. So I, this is a little bit about how TIF is calculated using just kind of a couple hypothetical numbers. I don't want to get too detailed into this. But kind of the important thing to realize with TIF is what we're talking about is capturing the future tax revenue from a site. Uh, so on the left here, we have the total, total market value. So in the, in the gray, we would have, so if you had a, a hypothetical increase of $250,000 in market value on a parcel that was originally $50,000 in value, you would have an incremental growth of $200,000 worth of value. So with tax increment financing, that base value that's present on the site gets maintained and frozen, and all those existing level of taxes continue to go to each of the taxing jurisdictions. It's that incremental growth that gets captured. So the blue is kind of the base numbers you hear. This would be a one-year illustration. So the blue is the base number, so you have the market value that results in tax capacity, and that tax capacity gets multiplied by the tax rate, resulting in <laughs> taxes to the entities. So the blue is the base level, the incremental growth in value, that $200,000 increase in market value results in additional tax capacity, which results in tax increment revenue. So if you were to show it over time, you would have the blue here would be the base that would be continued to be realized by each of the taxing jurisdictions, but it's that, that gray number up top is the amount that's gonna be captured each year of the TIF district over the next however many years that TIF district is eligible for that future revenue is what's gonna get captured and used to repay those costs. Uh, once the district's been de uh, decertified or the payment has been completed, that full property value comes back onto the general tax base and then that results in an additional tax revenue or additional tax base available to each of the taxing jurisdictions. Which so then goes into the general fund and then we can Yeah, exactly. Correct. So the important thing to remember with TIF or to consider with TIF is you know, as I illustrated in, the, in, the, in this previous slide, is we're talking about a future source of revenue. We're talking about tax dollars that will be generated over the next 10 to 26 years, depending on the type of TIF district. So how do we use that future revenue to fund costs that are gonna be incurred today? There's two ways to go about doing this. Uh, the one, one, one way of going about doing this is what's called uh, the pay-as-you-go basis. So in the case of a pay-as-you-go, use of TIF, the developer would be responsible for making those public improvement costs now, and they'd be reimbursed over time by that future tax increment revenue, and the reimbursement would be limited to the amount of TIF that's collected. So there's gonna be a future revenue stream, the developer would be incurring that cost today, and they would get reimbursed by that future revenue stream over time as the TIF revenue is generated, and only to the extent that the TIF revenue is generated. The other option, for funding costs is to the issuance of general obligation tax increment bonds. If you wish to issue tax increment bonds, you have to have at least 20% of the tax increment available to pay debt service on the bonds. You can fund, or you can issue TIF bonds in, in excess of the potential revenue capacity of the district with the acknowledgement that if you were to go down that, road, that route that there would be additional general fund revenues available for that. That's just the minimum uh, most often the intent is to fund those general increment tax increment bonds with the TIF revenue entirely. Uh, the minimum threshold for issuing that debt is simply 20%. So with the general obligation bond issue, there is an obligation to levy for the debt issue if needed, if the tax increment revenue is insufficient or uh, less than projected for a given year, 
uh, the obligation would be there to need to levy to offset that decrease or that, uh, that, lack of, that lack of revenue. One of the things that we can do to help offset that is we can put in place a minimum assessment agreement. So as part of the development agreement contract, the developer that would be realizing the benefit of the tax increment revenue would be willing to enter into an agreement that would be uh, recorded with the county that says that the minimum value for this property will be no less than this amount. And the idea behind that is that that's going to help reduce some of, the some of the potential variability of that future TIF revenue because future TIF revenue is going to be based off of future market values on sites. With, with a minimum assessment agreement, you at least know what that floor for that minimum value is going to be to help provide some cushion and help reduce some of that variability in the, in the event that there was a decrease in market values from what was projected. Uh, one of the things that is prevalent with TIF How is... How often does that happen, a decrease? <clears throat> uh, it's probably not that common, uh, but it, it, it is, there is a potential for it. Uh, obviously, risk we have to account for, but I understand. I'm just wondering how often it happens. Obviously, you know, I think the last time there was a big change in market values was obviously as a result of the recession back in 07, 08. There was significant decreases in TIF value or market value of property in general. Uh, that did result in some, some uh, minimum assessment agreements having to be put in place or having to be triggered uh, where they, the value might have otherwise gone below that. Um, but it, you know, it is, it's more of a preventative measure and it just helps provide some sta stability because ultimately when we're looking at TIF revenue projections, we are making assumptions about what future values are going to be and what future tax rates are going to be. Uh, one of the things that's also present with TIF is if there's a change in future tax rates, when you certify a TIF district, the tax rate for the district gets set at the current rate. If the rate goes up, that doesn't result in any additional tax increment revenue. That additional revenue as a result of an increase in tax rates flows through to those taxing jurisdictions. If the rate goes down, the TIF revenue will go down according to the amount that the rate goes down. So uh, TIF revenue is not able to be captured by that increase in tax rates, but it does potentially go down if the tax rates were to decrease. Um, <clears throat> So I think what's being contemplated for the two districts, two TIF districts in general terms, uh, without getting into too much specifics, is that it's proposed that the, the, uh, the, the affordable housing district would, is anticipated to be a pay-as-you-go project, whereas the economic development district is proposed to utilize tax increment bonds. So this is preliminary discussions right now, is that those bonds will be used to fund street improvements adjacent to the site. Uh, one of the things to consider as a policy point is when you are using tax increment bonds is what are we using the proceeds of those bonds for? Are we using them to reimburse the developer for on-site costs or are we using it to reimburse the city for public improvement type things? Is that something, you know, is the value of what the city is receiving in terms of the bonds and what they're being used for justify the use of those funds? Uh, so it's something just to consider as as the use of tax increment bonds is being proposed is what is what is what ultimately are they being used to fund as opposed to uh, necessarily the is it a you know public or private benefit in terms of that that utility well, and on top of that we have to make a decision based upon but for I mean mm -hmm. would that development truly be here if it wasn't for TIF mm -hmm. um, or do they leave I mean ultimately that's the simplest question we have to answer Exactly that that and then also yeah along with what are what are we using the funds for? So just uh, quickly how do we get how does the TIF district created what is the process so the city already has a development district So a development district is a larger area within which TIF districts are created the development district for the city is uh, the, the boundaries of the city we're gonna amend the development district to incorporate some additional property that's been annexed since the last time it was in place, but that's the only action there. And then the, with the actual creation of the TIF district is first the creation of a TIF plan. TIF plan defines the, the budget, the geographic boundaries, and the purpose of the TIF district. And it also sets the, the budget for the TIF district and defines how we're going to use those funds and describes the project. Uh, then we hold a public hearing and then we certify the district. So the process itself is approximately 60 to 90 days. It includes notifying the county and the school district of the TIF plan uh, and setting up a, a draft of the TIF plan. That draft goes out 30 days prior to the public hearing. Uh, when we set that, 
when we send that, in, that draft TIF plan to the county and school district, that's kind of similar to the way the city would set its preliminary levy. That sets the maximum amount or budget for the TIF district. We can go below that number, but we can't, can't go above it. it. Uh, so that's the important thing to remember when we talk about notifying the county and the school district, and that's 30 days prior to the public hearing. We have to notice the public hearing uh, with a publication in the city's paper that's uh, no less than 10 days prior to the public hearing and no more than 30 days prior to the public hearing. The Planning Commission will review the project to verify or to make a finding or recommendation that the project uh, is in accordance with the city's overall development plan as a whole. So basically find that the planning or that the proposed development conforms to the comprehensive plan. And then finally, uh, the city would hold a public hearing and take public comment. And following that, uh, you would be able to uh, make uh, take action on the development or on the TIF district and adopt a development agreement if you saw fit. So potential impacts of TIF on on property taxes is that the TIF does redirect tax dollars to define to meet a defined public purpose. It does assist projects that would not otherwise occur. That again is that but for finding, and it does add that tax base upon decertification of the district, which does result in a long term investment. But there is a cost to servicing those properties in the interim period. Uh, as that, as the TIF dollar or the tax dollars that would normally be generated on that project are being redirected to fund that project. That uh, with that, any questions? I thought that was very well explained in a really quick nutshell. Um, thank you for that. Um, but I will open it up. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you. Um, which now leads to the Trident development with Mr. Merrick. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Tonight we're asking the City Council to consider adopting Resolution 133.18, which would call for a public hearing on Monday, October 1st at 7 p.m. Uh, to consider establishing a tax increment financing district and financing plan. So this is for the uh, Trident Development Senior Housing Project uh, located at 926th Street West. Um, it's commonly referred to as the Lens and Bus Garage or My Pillow site. Uh, the city, a number of years ago, solicited RFPs for the site. Uh, one was um, taken by Shingabee and another for a townhome development site. The city uh, selected Shingabee Senior Housing Site, and then that uh, proposal has since been uh, transferred to Trident Development. They've submitted plans for a 60 unit senior housing complex uh, with assisted living and memory care. Um, the, the plan would go through the city's typical land use and zoning piece, uh, as well as, as Tom alluded to earlier, the tax increment financing, that analysis. And so tonight, uh, we're simply asking the city council to schedule a public hearing and essentially start the process. Uh, you're not being asked to provide any corresponding development or financing approval at this time. Uh, the planning commission and city council will go through that land use and zoning process, which will include uh, resident engagement opportunities for adjacent property owners to the project. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Merrick? I have one. Um, all we're doing is setting a public hearing to move this forward, which eventually lets us talk about what is about to occur. Correct. The building rendering, the site layout, the number of units, how many will be different affordable? Different dynamics, all of that is to come Eat. throughout the process. So you're oh. just kind of kickstarting it tonight. Thank you. I would entertain a motion on resolution number 13318. I'll make I'll a motion make a, to uh, adopt resolution 133 18, calling for a public hearing on Monday, October 1st, 2018, at 7 o'clock p.m., related to the establishment of a tax increment financing district and for the adoption of a tax increment financing plan. Motion by Councilmember Johnson. I'll second. Seconded by Councilmember Mock. Uh, any further discussion? Thank you, Mr. Trident. Uh, uh, no further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Adopted. Now moving on to uh, 9.2. Lakeview Industries has been extremely patient here and uh, wonderful, as always. Uh, moving on to Aaron Smith, City Planner. Thank you. Mayor and Council, tonight we are reviewing the concept plan for Lakeview Industries. So as part of the planning process, this is pretty early. Things are subject to change. Things we present tonight you. might look a little different as we continue through the process. 
A little bit of information about Lakeview Industries. They are currently in Chaska and they've been in business for over 30 years. They manufacture, fabricate flexible components including gaskets, die cuts, molded rubber parts, extrusions, and weather stripping. They serve a variety of markets. A lot of the parts you probably have in your home or your car, you just don't really know it because they're small, vital parts that we don't really think about as consumers. But they serve medical, recreation, agriculture, so on and so forth. And major customers that I thought we might recognize a little bit include Pentair, Medtronic, Bobcat, Toro, Polaris, and Fastenal. And Ford. And Ford. I listened. It's anticipated that 85 jobs are, will be at the Carver facility when they bring their business from Chaska to the city of Carver. Oh. Again, several of these drawings are really preliminary. They likely are going to change as we continue through the planning process. But on the screen, you have the project location. So it's just north of the Mills Fleet Farm site off Levi Griffin Road, west of Jonathan Carver Parkway. And on the right, we have a depiction of what the ultimate build out of the site will be. So in the yellow, orangish color is building one. So that's the first phase of the project that we're considering. You can see the dashed line that shows the phasing of the project. So tonight we're talking about phase one, that orange, yellowish color. So tonight it's being proposed at 143,000 square feet, again, subject to change. The site will be accessed off Dewalter Road, as well as Levi Griffin, includes stormwater ponds, as well as parking. Some 3D elevations to make the building feel a little more attainable, just looking at it as a picture. And the photo with the star shows our comprehensive plan. So the property is guided correctly today in our 2030 comprehensive plan. It re will require rezoning, which will come as we start talking about preliminary plat and final plat. But today it's guided correctly, but will require rezoning. So again, at this point tonight, there's no formal action. It's a time to provide feedback. There are members of the development team here tonight. So if you have feelings about the design of the building, uh, it, to give both to the development team and staff, I will open it up for discussion. Who put these pictures together? Was that us or them? Because I want to know who put the geese in there. Oh, well, that wasn't me. That's outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> you guys come on up. Probably going to have some questions. We might not. I don't know. I'd like to welcome you, though. Good evening. I'm Mike Schrod with Welsh Construction. I'm the design builder. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Are there tentatively two entrances off of Levi Griffin? So that's something that we're working through with the development team right now, is identifying that Levi Griffin is a likely will continue to be a collector in Carver and thinking about the accesses. So again, concept level, it likely will change, but something we've identified and working through. Any other questions, comments? Comments, um, I really like, and we heard this from the Planning Commission too, but I like how the loading dock will one day be tucked between those two buildings. Um, I like that. I like the preliminary early look at the buildings. The um, amount of windows and glass surprised me a little bit, and I like that those elements. I'm just happy you're here. I, it's fantastic, and what I mean, I don't, I don't have a dog in the pony show with the, how the building looks. I think you guys want it to look good. Um, I know Lakeview wants it to look good, so yes. yeah, we're just happy to have you. When we're looking at um, future expansion, do you have any idea or any plans on expanding at this point? Part of the overall planning, business planning for the company is is to grow. Um, they ultimately see that th their direct need could be 200,000 feet in within five years. Uh, so the expansion capabilities in the first building contemplates their ability to grow. Uh, in the meantime, it would be leased to, to third-party tenant. All I hear. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> doom, doom, doom. Uh, any other comments or questions? 
I think that's just a big welcome. Um, I, staff is available. I think Aaron is one of the best planners in the state. I think Mr. Merrick is one of the best, if not the best manager. We want to make this work for you, and if we are striving to become a very developer friendly, it certainly doesn't mean you get to walk all over us. But at the same time, we definitely want to make sure that we're developer friendly. So if you need anything, please let us know. Understood. And, and the staff's been great to work with so far and been very helpful. Good. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, moving forward, we are now to 9.3, our final plat for Oak Tree Phase 2, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Mayor and Council. You're welcome. Tonight we are discussing Phase 2 of Oak Tree's Thanks, final brother. plat. Appreciate it. As part of the project development, it's been identified that Oak Tree will likely be completed in four phases. So phase one was approved in March and April of 2018 by the Planning Commission and City Council. That included 63 lots, and it's the property along Jonathan Carver Parkway. So if you'll remember, it was towards the northeast corner and then the southeast corner. The northeast is 60 foot wide lots, and the southeast is the villa unit that's part of this development. Is, I'm sorry, that was hard to understand. The villa. Okay. So on the screen right now, you'll see in the colored rendering, there is a red dash along 18 units on the Oak Tree property. So those are the 18 units that are being discussed tonight for final plat. It's been identified by Lennar that they are looking to have all three of the home types that will be available in Oak Tree. They're looking to have all of the options available. So there's the 60 foot wide units, the 65, which these 18 units are, and then the smaller lot, which is that villa product. So tonight we're considering 18, 65 or greater uh, for width for the lots to give them that third type, which is that executive large lot single family. I'm not done. It just massively confused me. Oh, okay. Tell me more. Tell, tell me more. So tonight we're asking for approval on the 18 lots of phase two? Yes. That's it? Yes. Because that is going to be the villa process? No, that is the 65 foot. That's exactly. to the north in the phase one, which you've already- South. South. Oh yeah, this is flipped, you're right. Um, and which we've already approved. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. So as part of this project develops, there are two additional phases that are anticipated. So 204 tonight. The four phases are depicted now on the screen. I think this will be helpful. So it's lined up that JCP is on the far right of the photo. So the 63 units uh, that are identified in phase one have been previously approved. Phase two is the 18. Is that clear? Yes, okay. that's better. Thank you. Sure. So moving into some of the nitty gritty of the final plat, it'll be an extension off Maple Drive, extension of Maple Drive off White Pine Way, and the 18 lots tonight to be considered are consistent with the PRD slash R2 zoning that was approved with the preliminary plat. Some information about the landscaping plan. So these units do abut the large outlot in the center of the property that's going to be used for tree preservation as well as trails and each lot is shown to have additional boulevard trees added as part of the landscape plan. Will you say that last part again? So you phase off. I, 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 maybe I'm not in tune. Each lot will have a boulevard tree. Thank, thank you, that actually is helpful. Each lot will have a boulevard tree. Correct. Nice. So tonight we are looking for a proposed motion uh, in my wake, the, in the aftermath of my vacation, I'm gonna ask that Vicki pulls up something that I just emailed her. It's an updated resolution. Larry can talk through some of the specifics. I forwarded Larry my resolution. He had some tweaks while I was gone, so. Larry had tweaks? <laughs> Come on. Unheard of. Uh, unheard of. <laughs> Larry, tweak away. Vicki, can you pull up the red line on the right? It'll be easier for the council to follow the PDF version. That'll show the, ch that'll track the changes. Yes. Like yep. Oh, don't, don't you dare spill out second. <laughs> it, it has to match the plat. <laughs> the plat shows it as an How Arabic dare number. you, Aaron Smith? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Sorry. 
I will walk There's no the money. I will walk the council through the changes very quickly. Um, th the legal is just to match uh, the legals in Oak Tree. The initial part wasn't necessary. If you can get down to uh, number four, Vicki, this only matches, it's a definition for what are called Westwood plans, as is very common in these types of subdivisions. The plans come in as the final plat comes in, but there's city comments and they have to be revised. We needed a definition for the term Westwood plans because Aaron has a couple of provisions later in the resolution that as his customary says, all right, developer, you gotta revise the plans to meet the city comment letter. That's definitional. If you could go to the next substantive one is in paragraph 12, and this is the main change. The council may recall that when Oak Tree was originally platted, the first phase, there was an understanding that the developer would contribute towards improvements for Dahlgren Road. And there was sort of this global math that was done that said that the developer would pay $658 per lot. What the revision here does is it changes the paragraph to make it clear that the $658 per lot is payable only on these 18 lots. And then in order to facilitate the future phases, the last sentence does the math. It basically says, all right, the total assessment for all 200 lots is 131,600. The developer paid 41,454 with the first phase. It's paying 11,844. Um, with the second phase, and it still owes after all of that $78,302 when the next phase has come through. And the reason that I thought that was important is it's so everybody remembers the math in the right. next phases, and the developer goes. I think the only other change is in paragraph 15. Because there's an outlot that will be developed at a later time, uh, that's outlot A of Oak Tree Second, it'll be subdivided. This just makes it clear there's no park debt on that. City collects the park dedication at the time that outlot is platted. That's important because park dedication changes from time to time, and we only collect as outlots are done. Well, and that also states later on when they say, no, we already paid park dedication. No, you agreed to do it now. Yes. All right. Uh, those were the changes, and as Aaron said, it was just kind of ships passing in the night with her vacation. Are you comfortable with the changes? Yes, I am. Is the developer comfortable with the changes, or will we find that out? <laughs> Westwood is here tonight. Westwood's here. Come on up, bud. How are you doing? Great. Outstanding. Are we good? Are we still, uh, we're, we're good? Let's negotiate. <laughs> we have an attorney here. So, yeah, I'm Ryan Bloom with Westwood. I'm the civil engineer. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine that Lenar would have any problems. I mean, I, I think they were, they were understood the full assessment of the Dahlgren improvements, and this is just spelling it out on a per lot basis. So this isn't a big surprise is what you're saying? I don't, I don't believe so. Outstanding. Well, well done then. Are there any other questions for staff or Westwood? No, welcome aboard. We're happy to have you. You move dirt fast. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, finally, finally getting a lot of progress done out there. So it was yeah. wet for a while, wasn't yeah. it? Yes, it was. Yeah. All right. I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 132-18 approving Oak Tree phase two final plat. Do you need me to reference the? You should reference it's the one that was presented at the council meeting. Yep. Okay. Um, so I will approve the Oak Tree phase two final plat as presented. The resolution is presented at the council meeting. I'll second that. There's a motion by council member Mock and a seconded by council member Henry. Uh, questions, comments, concerns? I say well done, both of you. Especially, it's a lot easier to deal with Larry when you're on vacation. Um, but thank you. And thank you, Larry, for watching that. That's appreciated. And thank you for being amenable. Yeah, thanks. thanks for being here. Um, if there's no other comments or questions, uh, there's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Take care, Schultzes. Um, let's now move on to... Ironwood Park Pedestrian Bridges. Mr. Buddy, my buddy. Thank you, Mayor and Council. You're welcome. Um, 
uh, last week, the city has solicited quotes for uh, the site improvements on the Ironwood Park bridges. Uh, this included some site grading, construction of the bridge abutments, uh, the actual bridge installation, and uh, pouring of the concrete deck and, and trail paving. Um, the city had approved a quote, um, I believe at the last meeting or two meetings ago, that was actually the purchase of those bridges. And so this really, this would solidify, or this determines the contractor that would build the infrastructure so that the bridges could be set in place. And then this contractor also sets the bridge in place. So um, the, uh, we received two quotes uh, from contractors. We actually asked uh, six, six contractors to quote it, uh, but we received a low quote from SM Henches for $116,000, excuse me, $116,818. Uh, we also received a quote from Sunram Construction. Um, if this proceeds ahead, the substantial completion to have the bridge in place and, and functioning, functioning trail system would be November 21st of 2018. And we've asked that the contractor uh, not do any work during uh, school day, or, or not, excuse me, not access the site uh, from the school portion, so not accessing it, accessing it off of Ironwood, but they would access it from the north uh, where the Meridian Fields uh, development is coming in. And so uh, with that, I guess the recommendation is to approve the low quote of SM Henches, and with that, I'll leave it to any questions. Um, so before I open it up, I have one quick question. You said November 18th? Yes, is November that, 21st. Okay, that, is that for the earth movement to be done, or is that for placement of the bridges so that we don't have to store the bridges? Uh, that is for <laughs> placement of the bridges and finishing um, any of the site work that they can, which awesome. isn't, isn't going to be grass this year. So the bridges will be in this year? That is our goal. So yes. we don't have to store them? Correct. Outstanding. All right. Um, any comments, questions for Mr. Buddy? Entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve a quote from SM Hinges for the site improvement work for the Ironwood Park pedestrian bridges for $116,818. I'll second. Uh, motion by Councilmember Henry, seconded by Councilmember Johnson. Any further comments, questions? Motion in a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I don't think I'm missing anything. We're down to City Council Communications. Excuse me, Mayor. Oh. Did you want to go back to the 2019 project before we get into that? Oh, jeez, thank you. Um, we will go back uh, to the listening session of the 22, sorry, the 2019 improvement project. Anyone else have any comments they'd like to make? Yeah, come on up. You waited. Let's give you the floor. But please uh, state your name and address one more time. Andy Burgess, 428 Diedrich Drive. What amount of work can I do to make this easier for myself? Can I dig the trench to my house? Do I have to have my septic filled in? Can I leave it in place even though it's not being used? Uh, that kind of concern is there, too. I'm not sure what entails the project to begin with. It would be nice if there was some kind of detailed list as if this what they would have done or required to be done and how that would be paid for and time frame would have to be done in so andy when we're done here let's have you connect with andrew and brian and they can answer all those get a card because i can't see my oh phone. okay thank you yep well and at the end of the day what we this these guys have done this before they will have the answers and it's not like we're starting tomorrow they will make themselves let me phrase that. We'll make them available to you. Okay. And I'll probably hit the microphone again. But All right. we will get your questions answered. Okay. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, gentlemen? Come on up. Come on up. Oh, well, then. Oh, right on. Oh, you married your daughter. Oh, boy. But I'm, but I'm an old contractor. Are you okay with that, though? What's that? With him marrying your daughter? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, that was that was a great thing. We need you, you know, to grand, need... granddaughters. Granddaughters are fabulous. Yeah. They were much better than children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So if you could state your name and your address, just so we know where you're coming from. Uh, my name is Tim McFarland, and I live in Eden Prairie uh, on 7491 Ontario Boulevard. Thank you. Um, I heard a lot of people talking at our at our meeting, and I'm not sure 
because I, what I was hearing from the folks here are specific concerns. I'm not sure whether or not the, what I heard at the uh, tent meeting, you know, which was done be in the rain, I have to give these guys credit, they carried their own, uh, their own protection, so that was, that was great. Um, you've got a, a neighborhood here that first of all, when you talk about sidewalks, sidewalks are very easy to stick into a brand new neighborhood like you're putting in over by the school. They're very hard to put into neighborhoods that people have landscaped. You're talking about people taking down trees and landscaping. All city council has to do is drive through the neighborhood and you're gonna see why so many people are against the sidewalks. Not to mention the fact it's an added expense and you're also dealing with a neighborhood that isn't, um, you know, you've got a lot of new homeowners and you've got a lot of people that have been there since the development was made and they're gonna stay there. You know, this is, this is their retirement. So now you're talking about adding potentially $30,000 in cost to houses that have already got a predetermined value. Um, is there an incremental value for city sewer and water? Some people yes, some people no. I've owned both, would make no difference to me. What I heard people saying was that um, obviously the city can't do anything about the tie-in from the street to the house. That's a private contract. So each person is going to be dealing with that. If we, and please understand, these numbers are not accurate, but if we say that's a $10,000 bill and the city assessment comes back at a $10,000 bill and the city um, fees, permits, come back as a $10,000 bill, that's where the people are coming up with $30,000. Sure. The thing I heard people saying is they can cope with an assessment. They can probably deal with a $10,000 fee, you know, a $10,000 connection. They might not be able to connect $10,000 here plus pay the, um, the city fees, the Met Council fees, the tie-in fees, because now you're dealing with $20,000 out of pocket that may or may not be able to be assessed. So what I was hearing people was saying is if those fees have to be there, if those could also be set spread out as an assessment, that would help them dramatically. And when I see the thing on there that says they wanna know when they were tying in, what I heard people saying in our little group, we were one of, would you have five or six of those? Uh, in our little group was, if you do all of this out here, can I have like four years and then tie in there? allowing themselves to, you know, to save and do some of this as opposed to having to finance to do some of this. I heard several people saying, I don't have 30000 or $20,000 in the bank. And I think that's probably true of a lot of people. So that's what I heard in the tent. And I think you had a lot of folks here that are dealing with some specific issues. Some of these people are actually looking at a situation where you heard the one fellow he basically can't afford his house if he's got to come up with another 30 grand. So please take that into consideration. That's the idea behind the curb and gutter question as well. If they don't need it, if it's not providing a dramatic long-term value, don't spend the money on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Going once, anything else? Right on. Thank you for that. So now we are moving on to Council Communications. Uh, Monroe? Yes, sir. It's not an open meeting. Monroe? Um, I attended the uh, Carver County Thank Community you, Leaders meeting uh, last week in Thank you. Christie's stead. And the president, there was a presentation by <laughs> Health and Human Services concerning homelessness and poverty in Carver County. It was a very, very good presentation. I don't think we. I don't think we realize how much poverty and homelessness there is in Carver County. I mean, we're a very wealthy county, but it's there. And um, I thought it was a very worthwhile presentation. And um, I, cannot, I cannot remember the name of the gentleman who gave it, but he volunteered that he would go out to any of the cities and give the presentation. And I was thinking it would be good for the council, probably especially a new seated council, to see it. <laughs> So they know <laughs> we're not here. <laughs> well, I mean, we're short timers, you know. Yeah, I hear you, girl. I mean, it would be good so that they can see that, you know, this is another part of 
I'd actually I fear. like to see it. Too. Is it Rich, was it Richard Scott? Yes. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's all I have. Okay. Johnson? Um, the League of Minnesota Cities was out in Waconia this morning and hosted a coffee for city staffs and elected leaders. Um, it was really good just to hear a little bit more about what they've kind of got in the hopper um, and what they're working on, the services they provide and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the only other thing that I have is tomorrow is National Night Out or Night to Unite, whatever you want to call it. Midtown um, Carver. Midtown Carver is going to be having a get together as will a lot of neighborhoods throughout the city. Yep. Um, I would just add to the LMC thing. It's really nice to see how fluid and open the LMC is. They were really there to find out how they could make their organization better and serve cities um, within their realm. And I think, and don't quote me on the numbers, but I asked him if it was a membership drive. And what he stated, Luke Fisher was their director. And or, what's his title? Deputy director. Thank you, deputy director. Um, there's 856 cities within the state of Minnesota, and 825 or 30 are members of the right. LMC. It's pretty cool. Um, really great organization, and I would add that uh, our esteemed city manager is on the board of directors at the League of Minnesota Cities. And they do a fantastic job, so didn't mean to no, mock. The only thing I have is that the planning, or excuse me, the HPC um, meeting is moved to Wednesday, August 15th. I don't know if we know that we will be hosting one for sure or not, but it's a different date that we've normally been because we do Tuesdays. We're not anticipating an agenda for August. Okay. Sounds good. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Parks Commission meeting will be Monday. Other than that, I got nothing. Mr. Merrick. Smittix. Quick reminder, we have a Design Carver meeting next Wednesday and an open house on the 22nd. Exciting. I'm excited for that. That's exciting. <laughs> Mr. Harris? Brian? Andrew? Vicky? Camera guy? Nothing. <laughs> I have nothing. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion is second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you all.